I've laid out a three-part plan to address costs families are facing. One, first part of that plan, fixing the supply chain. Two, protecting consumers and promoting competition. Three, lowering kitchen table costs, including with my Build Back Better Act. Good day, everybody. It's Andrew here, and welcome back to my channel. President Biden just gave a speech laying out his plans to move forward with the next stimulus package, which should include the check for seniors that Bernie Sanders is pushing to include. Now, he cites the fact that the economy continues to recover, and he gives the credit for this to the American Rescue Plan, which was the last stimulus package with the third stimulus check. So he goes on to say that in order to continue this economic recovery and help the American people who are still struggling, we need to get the next stimulus package done and we need to include a stimulus check for seniors. Now in this speech, he goes over other things like fixing supply chain issues, getting vaccinated to help overcome this pandemic and just return back to normalcy, normalcy in general. But he does point out the fact that people are still struggling, seniors are still struggling to pay their rent, pay for medical expenses, and a stimulus check for seniors, of course, in my opinion especially, is still needed in this country. So with that said, before we watch President Biden's speech, all I ask is that you do me a quick favor, hit like, and hit subscribe. It truly goes a long way in supporting our work. So let's watch President Biden's speech. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And again, don't forget to subscribe. We're going to have a lot more updates these next couple of weeks as Democrats continue to push to get the next stimulus package done, increase Social Security benefits, and include a stimulus check for seniors in this next stimulus package. So let's take a look, see what President Biden said, and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I want to talk about, uh, uh, I think it's a historic day for our economic recovery. Today's national unemployment rate fell below 4% to 3.9%, the sharpest one-year drop in unemployment in United States history. <clears throat> the first time the unemployment rate has been under 4% in the first year of a presidential term in 50 years, 3.9% unemployment rate. Years faster than experts said we'd be able to do it, and we have added 6.4 million new jobs since January of last year, in one year. <clears throat> that's one of the most, that's the most jobs in any calendar year by any president in history. How? How? How did that happen? Well, the American Rescue Plan got the economy off its back and moving again, back on its feet getting over 20, 200 million Americans fully vaccinated, got people out of their homes and back to work, even in the face of wave after wave of COVID. We got schools open. We got booster shots. We brought down the poverty rate. It went from 20 million people on unemployment rolls a year ago to under 2 million people on the unemployment rolls today. America's back to work, and there are more historical accomplishments. The increase in Americans joining the labor force was the fastest this year of any year since 1996. And among prime age workers, <clears throat> ages 25 to 54, their increase in labor force participation was the biggest in 43 years. Record job creation, record unemployment declines, record increases in the people in the labor force. I would argue the Biden economic plan is working and is getting America back to work, back on its feet. But the record doesn't stop there. Today's report also tells us that record wage gains, especially for workers in some of America's toughest jobs, women and men who work in the frontline jobs in restaurants, hotels, travel, tourism, desk clerks, line cooks, waitstaff, bellmen, they all saw their wages at a historic high, the highest in history. Their pay went up almost 16% this year, far ahead of inflation, which is still a concern. Overall, wage gains for all workers who were not supervisors went up more in 2021 than any year in four decades. There's been a lot of press coverage about people quitting their jobs. Well, today's report tells you why. 
Americans are moving up to better jobs, with better pay, with better benefits. That's why they're quitting their jobs. This isn't about workers walking away and refusing to work. It's about workers able to take a step up to provide for themselves and their families. This is the kind of recovery I promised and hoped for for the American people, where the biggest benefits go to the people who work the hardest and are more often left behind, the people who have been ignored before, the people who just want a decent chance to build a decent life for their families, just given a clear shot. For them, wages are up, job opportunities are up, layoffs are down to the lowest levels in decades, and there are more chances than ever to get ahead. No wonder one leading economic excuse me, analyst described what we've accomplished in 2021 as the strongest first-year economic track record of any president in the last 50 years. Today, America is the only leading economy in the world where the economy as a whole is stronger than before the pandemic. Now I hear Republicans say today that uh, my talking about this strong record shows that I don't understand. I don't understand. A lot of people are still suffering, they say. Well, they are. Or that I'm not focused on inflation. Malarkey. They want to talk down the recovery because they voted against the legislation that made it happen. They voted against the tax cuts for middle-class families. They voted against the funds we needed to reopen our schools, to keep police officers and firefighters on the job, to lower health care premiums. They voted against the funds we're now using to buy COVID booster shots and more antiviral pills. I refuse to let them stand in the way of this recovery. And now my focus is on keeping this recovery strong and durable, notwithstanding Republican obstructionism. Because, you know, I know that even as jobs and families' incomes have recovered, families are still feeling the pinch of prices and cost. So we're taking that on as well. And that's the, and the way to do that is not to step back from the economic progress we made but to build on it. I've laid out a three-part plan to address costs families are facing. One, first part of that plan, fixing the supply chain. Two, protecting consumers and promoting competition. Three, lowering kitchen table costs, including with my Build Back Better Act. First, the supply chain. A couple of months ago, we heard a lot of dire warnings about supply chain problems leading to a crisis around the holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas. We acted. We brought together business and labor to solve the problems. The much predicted crisis didn't occur. The Grinch did not steal Christmas, nor any votes. <laughs> Look, the number of containers sitting in on docks for more than eight days is now down by nearly 40 percent. The number of packages delivered on time was nearly 99 percent. Workers stayed on the job and did the job to bring goods to consumers. We're continuing to work to speed up every step of this process. <clears throat> the ports, trains, trucking. My bipartisan infrastructure plan, law, included significant investments in each of these areas. And I want to thank the 19 Republicans in the Senate and the 13 in the House who stepped in to help pass it so we didn't have to face another filibuster and lose a very badly needed plan. The second area, protecting American consumers. In the last few decades, in too many industries, a handful of giant companies dominate the market in meat processing, railroads, shipping. Too often, they use their power to squeeze out smaller competitors, stifle new entrepreneurs, and raise the prices, reducing options for consumers and exploiting workers to keep wages unfairly low. You see that in your own life. Just look at your grocery bill and the cost of meat. It's not because the cattle farmer's getting rich. Matter of fact, it's the exact opposite. It's because fewer processors can charge grocery stores much more money for their ground beef, for example. 
You've heard me say it before. Capitalism without competition isn't capitalism. It's exploitation. And I'm determined to end the exploitation. Later this month, I'll be meeting with my competition council, which includes key economic leaders from across my administration, to keep pushing for more broad action and increase competition across our economy, because healthy competition produces lower prices, higher wages, and more dynamic and innovative economies. That makes everybody better off. Third, I'm working to reduce the largest cost burden of household budgets, costs that don't need to be such a burden. And the biggest weapon at our arsenal is my Build Back Better Act, which will reduce what families have to pay for basic necessities to live a life, raise a family, from prescription drugs to health care to child care, and more help so families can cover the cost of raising their children and caring for their loved ones, their older loved ones. As we've seen over and over and over again throughout this pandemic, if people can't find affordable childcare, they can't work. Right now, there are two million extremely qualified women who have not been able to return to work because they can't find or can't afford childcare. On healthcare, we've made quality coverage through the ACA more affordable than ever before, with families saving an average of $2,400 on our annual premiums, and four out of five consumers finding quality coverage for under $10 a month. And the result, when you reduce the cost of health care, more people can afford to get it. Over 4 million people have gained coverage since I became president. You've heard me say it a million times, having health care is also about peace of mind. For example, we're going to make it so nobody will pay more than $35 a month for insulin. Imagine you're a parent and well, the one of the 200,000 children in this country have type 1 diabetes. Insulin can cost, on average, it's average 650 bucks a month, but cannot cost as much as $1,000 a month.